Netflix and Google aren't your friends. They just want your money and your data. And that goes for just about every other corporation out there. But the good news is that you don't have to rely on services like Google Drive, Netflix, or Alexa for everything. In a matter of just minutes, I'm going to show you how to set up a super simple home server that you can use to store files, stream media, automate your home, and much more. Oh, and even host your own VPN so that you can securely access all of those services from anywhere in the world. Let's get started. Trying to sell your products or services online can be tricky. And I know this because I recently went through the process of trying to set up an online store for some Hardware Haven merch. And it was daunting to say the least. Fortunately, there's Squarespace, the sponsor of today's video. Squarespace makes e-commerce a breeze, from helping you manage inventory and item statuses, to creating custom discounts, to managing customer info. And everything integrates seamlessly into your website, whether you're looking to sell physical goods, digital products, subscriptions, or services, Squarespace can help you get the job done and start making money. Plus, their advanced SEO tools can help make sure people find your product, and they're constantly adding other cool new features. If you're looking to start selling online, check out Squarespace. After giving things a go with a free trial, you can go to squarespace.com slash hardwarehaven and use code hardwarehaven at checkout to get 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. So what are you waiting for? Start selling with Squarespace today. So why should you have a server at all? Well, like I mentioned a minute ago, it's a good way to distance yourself from greedy, data-hungry companies, and it can even save you money by not paying for some of the services they offer, like Google Drive, for example. There are also a lot of handy things you can do with a simple server like this, such as running Home Assistant to easily control and automate your smart home devices, or streaming your personal movie collection to TVs, media players, and phones using something like Jellyfin. And if you're just a nerd like me, it can also just be a lot of fun. But if you're new to something like this, I'll admit that it can be a bit intimidating and stressful. Fortunately, I found what might literally be the easiest way to self-host your own services by using something called Casa OS. Casa OS simplifies a lot of the more complicated stuff and lets you just focus on getting your apps and services up and running quickly. To be fair, it's not the best platform for everything. There are great alternatives like Open Media Vault or Unraid, for example, that offer a lot more features and control, but come at the cost of being a bit more complex to set up. Casa OS is free to use and incredibly simple, and you can run it on pretty much any PC or even a Raspberry Pi, because it's not actually an operating system, it's just an application layer that runs on top of something like Debian Linux and a handful of other Linux distros. And if all that Linux talk just made you really nervous, no worries. You can just pick up one of these Zima boards, which come pre-installed with Debian and Casa OS, so it's literally ready to go out of the box. You can just plug it into your network, and the server is up and running in seconds. Pretty cool. The Zima board is a bit more expensive than other options, like using an old desktop that you stored away in a closet or something, but it takes up almost no space and consumes only around 6 watts or so at idle. That's less than a standard LED light bulb, meaning in the long run, you might actually save money if your electricity is a bit more on the expensive side. I'm going to be doing this tutorial with the Zima board, but if you want to use a different PC, all you need to do is look up how to install Debian 11 or Raspberry Pi OS if you use a Raspberry Pi, and then you'll need to run a few simple commands, but I'll have some information on that down in the description if you're interested. You'll also need an ethernet cable and access to your router or switch because you will absolutely want to run this wired as running a server over Wi-Fi isn't nearly as fast or reliable. And lastly, you might want to have a spare hard drive or two because the Zima board only has 32 gigabytes of onboard storage. I'm going to use a couple of these two terabyte, two and a half inch drives, but you can pretty much use whatever makes sense for you. With the Zima board, you can connect drives via SATA, but it can look a little messy. So today I'm actually going to be using this dual two and a half inch USB drive enclosure because, well, it looks better. And it's a lot of fun to pop out and pop back in. I will have an Amazon affiliate link for this in the description if you're interested. Now, USB can be a little bit less reliable than SATA, but we're not running anything mission critical here, so I'm just gonna roll with it. You can use any typical external hard drive, but you might wanna consider having two drives, but we can talk about that later. 
With all of the hardware ready to go, you can plug this soon-to-be server into any open LAN port on your router, or in my case, just a network switch, and then power it on. And that's it. Now we can head over to the web browser and start setting things up. Okay, so now that we've got it plugged in, let's go ahead and head over to our web browser where we can type in casaos.local and hit enter. And hopefully this should pop up. If this doesn't pop up for you, then you'll need to type in your IP address. And that can be a little tricky to get to. You can either plug in a keyboard, monitor, and mouse, and then go to the desktop of Debian, or Casa OS, Debian. And in the network settings, you can find where your IP address is. Or you can also, if you know how to access your router settings, you can go into your router settings. So for me, I use a thing called PFSense and I can go into my DHCP server settings and see a client list. And so here I can actually see that my IP address is 192.168.10.187, but that's gonna be different depending on your router. So you may just have to look up how to see DHCP clients in your router and then look for the name Casa OS. So I can actually type in this as well into my browser. And we can see that we also got to the Casa OS web UI like that. Usually though, this casaos.local works just fine. All right, so to get started, we'll hit go and you can create a username. This can be whatever you want it to be. So I'm gonna say Haven and then just a password that you can remember. And then you can accept this news feed from the Casa OS blog, which I'm gonna go ahead and hit accept. That way I can see when there's updates because they seem to be updating the software somewhat consistently. Okay, and now we're in our Casa OS dashboard, which is pretty awesome. There's a lot of cool things here. Um, let's just take a quick look around. So we have some time, we have um, a search bar, we have a few little update things that pop up here. We have our apps, which we don't really have much going on, but we'll add some more in a bit. And then we have storage, uh, which I don't have my USB drives plugged in just yet, but we'll do that here in a second. And then we can see some network settings. So I'm using this second interface that's ENP3, so we can see our network usage. And yeah, it's pretty cool. Up here at the top left, we have an account button. So we can see my Haven user. I can go in and change my name and my password. Under settings, we have a few things here, and you'll probably, if you're using USB storage, wanna make sure that this unmount USB drive is checked. Uh, this is where you can also update if there's new updates to Casa OS. Right now I'm on version 0.4.3, obviously. And then this last tab here uh, lets us see logs. So this, don't let this freak you out. This is just maybe if you need to troubleshoot, this could be helpful. And then we do have access to the terminal. And it gets a little confusing because we, we created our Haven user or whatever your username was, and that is for the, the web UI. But for the actual underlying operating system that's behind all this, which is Debian in this case, uh, there's different users for that. And so in this case, we're actually gonna type in the username Casa OS, and then password, same thing. And this is the default user on Casa OS, especially if you're using the Zima board. And so now we're actually in the command line and trust me, we won't have to do a whole lot here, but I do wanna do at least one thing, which is change the password to the Casa OS user. Because if someone gets a hold of the server somehow and they see that everything says Casa OS, they're gonna know how to sign in as this user and maybe do some nefarious things. So we can just type in sudo, S-U-D-O, and then pass WD and then Casa OS. And then we're gonna type in our old password, which is just Casa OS. And then let's type in a new password. And you won't be able to see this, but that's fine. And now it's updated. So remember that password because we're gonna need that in the future for things. But that is our Linux user account, that Casa OS. And then our Haven user is a little bit different. That's just for getting to this web UI. Okay, how about let's set up our storage. I'm gonna plug in my two drives really quick. Give me just one second. Okay, so USB can be a little bit finicky, so be ready for that. If you have the option to install via SATA and you don't mind it looking a little weird, I would do that. But we do see these two drives that just popped up and that is a great sign. If this doesn't happen, try restarting your system first. And if it still doesn't work, then maybe try plugging those drives into a different computer and like you know reformat the drive to a single partition and then try plugging it in again. But now we can see we have these two Western digital drives. And if we click this little settings icon here, we see that we have these two storage drives and I'm going to hit format here, and that's just going to take away this XFAT partition that I already had and replace it with ext4 
just to make sure everything's all the same. And here this password is going to be the password that we used for our web UI user. So that's Haven in my example. So this drive will get formatted really quick. Sweet, so we have our two terabyte one here. And then here I'm going to format this one as well doing the same thing. Now, while this is formatting, I do want to talk about RAID because that is one huge downside to using something like Casa OS. Normally, when you'd have like a storage server like a NAS or something like that to save all your files over the network, you typically want to set it up in a RAID array or a redundant array of independent disks. Basically, it usually gives you either a benefit in speed by combining multiple disks or usually the, the main goal is for redundancy. So if one drive fails, you don't lose your data. Unfortunately, Casa OS doesn't currently offer that, but it's supposed to be coming in an update according to some responses on their GitHub. But for now, we're just gonna run these as independent disks, and I'm gonna show you a way that you can do some backups from one to the other one in a kind of weird way, but it will work. There is this merge storages here, but I don't recommend, oh, Oh, I just clicked it. Okay, whew, got nervous. Um, I don't recommend doing this. A, they're currently testing it, at least in the version I'm in, and also, I don't entirely know how it'll work in terms of if you lose one of the drives, but you merged all of them into one big virtual disk, do you lose everything on that virtual disk or, or not? So I would just keep them as separate drives for now, but cool. So we have our drives mounted. We have them formatted. If we head over into files, we can actually see, we do have, um, this is the root directory on our built-in storage on the Zima board. And so we have a whole lot of folders here, including this data folder that already has some pre-generated folders that we're not really going to use because there's not a whole lot of storage on this. And then it also has a documents, downloads, gallery, media. We're not really going to use those just because it's not a whole lot of storage on this. We're going to primarily rely on our external drives. So under this two terabyte one, they're kind of out of order, which is a little annoying. Um, but under this one, I'm going to create a folder and I'm going to call this Casa Share. And I could hit this shared thing right here, but I'm gonna hit submit just in case you ever wanna share a folder that you've already made. And so I'm gonna go back to this folder and hit share. And we're gonna set up a network share so that we can save, read, delete files on this drive from anywhere on our network, which is pretty cool. And it's already set up because it does this really quickly and easily. Like I said, Casa OS takes a lot of the complexity out of setting up something like SMB. It just sort of does it for you, which is good and bad, but for someone who's just wanting to get started, it's great. Um, so right here we can see PC Windows Explorer. I can copy this or just click this button. And then in our file explorer, I'm just gonna paste this really quick. And you might get a prompt here to type in a username and password, and you can just type in the Casa OS username and password, not the web UI. Um, I think I could be getting that wrong. I can't remember because I was doing some testing. It automatically is signing me in now that I'm, I'm on here. I'm realizing that. So you may get a prompt for username and password. You just may need to authenticate that before you can connect to it. But now I'm actually on this Casa OS .local. And um, let's say I actually, I don't want to have to type that in every time. What I can do, I could go down to this network tab and you know, I have a few other things here. I can go to this Casa OS .local. I can also go to network. Oh, sorry. Nope. I go to this PC, ignore all of this mess. I can go to map network drive and I'm going to call this, I don't know why I'm picking S, Casa, I guess. And then I'm going to paste that same Casa OS .local slash Casa share into there. And I'm gonna connect using different credentials. Hit finish. And then here I'm gonna type in Okay, so it is the web user password. I just typed in the wrong one because I'm silly. And now I can basically access this like it's a drive on my computer almost, like it's it's mounted and I can just go to disk S and now I'm on my Casa share folder. So anything I put in here will show up in that folder on the web UI, but will also show up for any other users that are connected to this network share. So I'm actually gonna paste over a video really quick. It's a, a short video and that took no time at all. Uh, but I can actually pull this up, and this is a YouTube short I made a while back, and it's playing off of our server just fine. And I can actually minimize this. Go back to the web UI, and under Casa Share, I can see that we have our video right here, and I can even play it in the web browser. And that's pretty cool. It lets us move files to and from our server or share them with other people. And uh, 
you might not find this as interesting as I do, so let's maybe move on to something more fun. But before we do that, if you're liking this video, if you find this helpful, maybe give me a like as that helps a lot. And also consider subscribing if you wanna see some more. But now let's move into something more fun like Home Assistant. So if we go back to the web UI, we can go to the App Store and, ooh, it's right there, right on the front page. We can hit, oh, okay, it went away, <laughs> oops. Uh, it's right here as well. We can just hit install. And this is actually using what's called Docker, which is sort of like taking almost an entire operating system of a computer or an application and, and kind of running it in its own little self-contained environment. It's, it's hard to explain. I'm not going to go way into it, but it's kind of like a little bundled up application that has its own like storage, its own files, its own everything, but is used to usually run like one specific application or service. So in this case, we're actually using the Linux server.io image of Home Assistant, which we can actually even go there. So on the Linux server.io page, which is sort of like a community driven collection of Docker containers or Docker images, we can find Home Assistant and click on it. And here's all the information. If you were going to set this up on your own, you could look into all of this and see all the different parameters. But once again, Casa OS kind of makes this easy for us. We can just go here and it's already set up and running. And we can, if we go to settings, we can see that it plugged in a lot of this information for us. It went and got the image for this Docker container and gave it a name, set up the port for the web UI and a bunch of other configuration down here. So we don't have to do that. It does it for us, which is really cool. Now you could really quick, America, Chicago is my time zone, but you could change this to America, whatever, or Europe, London, or whatever you wanted to change it to. I'm gonna leave it as that because it's actually correct and just hit X really quick. And if we click on this, it's gonna open up a new tab and we're in Home Assistant. If this doesn't open up right away, just give it a few more minutes. It has some setup it has to do, but we can set up Home Assistant. I'm gonna type in a username and a password. And I'm not gonna get super into detail here about how Home Assistant works because this isn't really what this video is. There's a lot of great tutorials that you can find. And yeah, I'm just gonna get this set up really quick and kind of show you a little bit of what you can do with it. But yeah, we use Home Assistant all the time to automate a lot of our smart devices in our house. As you can see, a lot of them popped up here already that I might be blurring them out because there's some confidential stuff. And then once we're in, I'm gonna go to settings. I'm gonna delete a lot of these that it automatically found because I, like I said, I'm gonna have to blur this out. Give me just a second. Okay, so I ignored a lot of these really quick just so I could get to, um, to here because these are actually the two smart bulbs that are in this studio right now. So we can hit configure on, for example, the studio lamp. It's actually the lamp right over there. Let's submit. Uh, it's already labeled in the LifeX app, so I'll just hit finish. And then same here for the backlight. That's the one behind my desk. Cool, so now if I go to overview, I can actually go grab this lamp and change it. It's pretty cool. So I'm not going to go crazy with, with Home Assistant. You can do a lot of configuring this um, dashboard here and then get it set up in your phone to use like an app on your phone to control lots of things. We control mostly lights, but you know, we have smart switches for our fans. We have our thermostat on here so we can set schedules and automations. Uh, we can even have motion detection for my cameras to like turn lights on if there's motion in certain areas. So it's really, really cool and you can really dive into it. Or you can just set up some simple things because you know, you don't want to necessarily have Google or Amazon be in charge of all of your light switches. But that's about it. Home Assistant is super cool. We could just exit out of that and we're back on our dashboard. Okay, uh, so we have some home automation going on. What about streaming some movies and shows and things like that? Well, I'm not gonna show you how to get those movies and shows. I do have a video you can watch here where I set up a server that can rip Blu-rays and DVDs and then transcode those files and stream them. But you can also do something very similar to that with Make MKV and a Blu-ray disc reader and rip your own Blu-rays, or you can find movies and shows in other ways that I'm not gonna talk about right now. But however you get a hold of the files for your shows and movies, it'd be cool to have a nice way to stream them. And so we're gonna do that with a thing called Jellyfin. So let's get into it. Same as before, we're gonna go back to the App Store and then find a Jellyfin and hit Install. We're gonna hit continue in the background really quick and start setting up some files. So I'm gonna go in here to our Casa Share folder and create a new folder called Jelly. And then inside that folder, I'm gonna make two more folders, one called Movies and one called Shows. 
And then under movies, I'm actually going to upload a file really quick. And now I'm doing this from the web UI, but I could also just drag this in via Explorer with our SMB share that we set up earlier. But I'm going to upload Knives Out really quick, and that is a big upload. So we'll probably have to leave that running for a little bit in the background. And then under Shows, I'm going to upload another file. Actually, I'm gonna upload a folder. I have this folder here, The Office US, that has the first season of The Office. Now, while this is uploading, we can go back to Jellyfin and we see we have this new container here. It's all good to go, but we're gonna make some tweaks this time. So if I go here and go to Settings, we're actually gonna make a few little changes. So the first thing we're gonna do is where it says Volumes, these are mapped volumes. So basically storage on our server, like our Zima board, for example, here, we can map a destination to a folder within the container. That way, anything that's on, you know, let's say within that jelly folder on our machine also shows up in a jelly folder inside the jelly fin container. It'll make more sense once we do it. Let's just hit add. And then here, normally you could click this button and get to folders, but with USB mounted drives, it doesn't work that way. So we're gonna have to click cancel. And I'm actually just gonna make a new, I'm just gonna duplicate this Casa OS tab, go to files, go to our Casa share jelly, and I'm going to copy the path here. And then back here, I'm going to paste this path because it's gonna be a pretty big path. And then the container, we're just gonna do slash jelly. And that'll make sense here in just a little bit. We also want to go down here to devices and click add and then type in slash dev slash DRI. And then we can copy all of that and paste it to the container side. And what that's going to do is give the container access to the hardware acceleration on the Intel chip inside the Zima board, because that CPU has what's called quick sync or it's hardware that's dedicated towards transcoding video, which, okay, why would you want to transcode video? Well, let's say we have a 4K movie or we have a 1080p movie, but it's HDR, and that's not really supported over a certain client. Maybe a media player doesn't support certain codecs or certain resolutions, or maybe it's just you're streaming from a cellular connection and you want it to be a much lower bitrate stream. Well, you're gonna to have to take that big video file and transcode it into a much smaller video stream. And that can be pretty taxing on the CPU, but if we have dedicated hardware transcoding, it can be offloaded to that and it just works a lot better. So I'm gonna show you that in action here in a second, but all we have to do is map this device, this slash dev slash DRI, hit save. And let's see, I'm curious how our file uploads are going. All right, we still got quite a ways. So I'm going to take a quick break and I'll come right back once this is all uploaded. So I'll see you in just a little bit. Okay, so I actually just found that it was faster to transfer the files directly over the SMB share, the network share, just using Windows Explorer. So I copied it over. We can actually see we're in our Casa OS share, uh, our Casa share, and then there's the folder Jelly. And under Shows, we have The Office Season 1. And then under Movies, we have Knives Out. So back in Casa OS, we can go ahead and head to this Jellyfin server. Hit Next. And I'm just going to do a username of Haven and, oh gosh, Haven and no password. And then now we're going to add some media libraries. And this is where it was helpful that we passed that Jelly volume mount because we can select Jelly and then Movies. And then up here, Content Type, Movies, Display Name, Movies. Hit OK. And then we'll do another one for Shows. So Content Type Shows, Folder, Jelly, Shows. And now we can hit Next. Next, next, finish. And then we'll sign in as Haven, no password. And this may take a little bit to scan all of this stuff, but we can hopefully go to shows really quick and see the office. And I can just go ahead and play an episode. And it's playing just fine because this is actually a DVD quality video. So if I go to playback info, we'll see it's doing what's called direct playing, which means it's streaming the full stream, the full file over the network. But what happens if we go back to something like Knives Out, which is only 1080p, but it's HDR10, and that may have some issues depending on the, the player you're watching it back on. Okay, so we can see just starting this, it's pretty choppy. And if I go here to playback info, we can see why. It's because it's transcoding 
because the video's arrange type is not supported, which is something you'll see fairly often. And so it's having to transcode on the CPU. And if I actually drag this window in here, you can see in COS OS, the CPU is just getting slammed by Jellyfin. So how can we fix that? Well, we passed through that slash dev DRI device earlier. So we can go to home, or actually this little hamburger menu, administration dashboard, and then playback. And then here where it says hardware acceleration, we're going to say Intel Quick Sync. And then we're gonna enable for H.264 and HEVC. And scroll all the way down to the bottom and hit save. Now this should work for the Zima board, depending on the system you're using. If it's not a Zima board, it may be a little bit different. So you'll have to look up the CPU or the graphics card you have in that system and see if it supports hardware transcoding and like what the settings are. So now if I go back to movies and I try playing Knives Out, still takes a second to load because it's a really, really big file, but we see it's playing back much more smoothly, even though we still are transcoding. So I can go, for example, skip ahead. It's going to take a second just because it's a, once again, it's a big file, but it's playing back pretty smoothly. And if I pull up Casa OS again, we see our CPU is down at 17%. So the hardware transcoding is working perfectly. And that is, that is great. Well, what can we do now? There's a lot of things. There's a, in, in the built-in app store here, there's not a ton, but there's a good amount of things like photo prism is sort of like a Google photos ish kind of thing. It lets you save photos and organize them by like what they are. And it can do like facial recognition and stuff, which is pretty cool. Um, there's a whole lot of other stuff in here, but we're going to solve two problems that you might already be thinking of, which is, okay, you talked about not having RAID earlier. How do I make sure I don't lose my data if a drive fails? And then also what happens if I want to install something and it's not in this app store, what do I do? Well, let's tackle the first one. Uh, and to do that, we're going to use a thing called Duplicati. But I'm gonna hit install. While it's running in the background, we'll go to files and we're gonna to go to our second drive here. And I'm going to create a folder and call this Casa Duplicati and hit submit. And then we'll go back to here and we'll see it's installing still, so we'll give it just a second. All right, it's installed, but once again, we're gonna make some tweaks. So let's go to settings. And then down here, once again, we're gonna change the volume mounts, or we're just gonna add one. So we're gonna hit add, and once again, we're going to need to grab some paths. So let's go to files, and we're going to copy this Casa Duplicati we made. Paste the path there, and we're gonna call this Casa Duplicati, make a new one. And then here we're gonna go grab just our whole Casa share, copy the path there, paste it, and we'll call this Casa share. And what we're doing is we're giving this Duplicati image access to those two folders so that we can make backups of this Casa share to Casa Duplicati. And we can also make backups of Casa share to Google Drive or Backblaze B2 storage or something like that in the cloud. Um, so yeah, one thing we, we need to make a few tweaks here. I learned this the hard way when I was testing things around. By default, this Linux server.io image sets the user ID and group ID as 1000. That's to make sure it's not root, so this thing can't do anything sketchy. We're going to need to set it to root to be able to have the right permissions, easily at least, to save backups onto our local storage. And then I'm gonna change my time zone to America, Chicago. And then that should be it, we can hit save and it will take a little bit for the container to spin back up. So we'll just give it a minute. Okay, and then we can hit Duplicati and we get this first run set up. If your machine is in a multi-user environment, you need to set a password to prevent other users from accessing the data. Uh, we could, I'm not going to worry about it because for the most part, people aren't gonna access this unless they have the password to our web UI for Casa OS. So I'm just gonna hit no, but if you're worried about any of that sort of stuff or if your data is really confidential, you might hit yes and do a password. You can always go back in here and add one in settings later too. But I'm going to go to add backup and we're just gonna do a local backup first. So I'm going to say configure a new backup and we'll call this Casa local. And I'm not going to encrypt this. Um, it's really not that big of a deal for local storage anyway. If you're doing this to the cloud, you might want to encrypt it, but I don't want to have to type in another password. So we'll hit next. And now destination is where we want to save these volumes to. 
So I'm just going to hit Casa Duplicati. It's a little weird. You can hit manually type path here just to make sure that it shows up. And we shouldn't have to use a username or password because we already have permissions and everything. So we'll hit test connection. Connection worked because it's local storage. We'll hit next. And then this is where we're going to copy everything from. And so we're just going to go to computer, Casa Share. And then normally I would just select Casa Share, but this is going to be a really big backup if I do that and it's going to take a while. So for the sake of this video, I'm actually going to cheat and I'm just going to select this one file here, but I would select this whole Casa Share then hit next and here you can set up a schedule so you can say i want to run instead of 1 p.m let's maybe change it to 1 a.m and then it's going to start tomorrow 1 a.m and it's going to run every day and these are the allowed days you can set up a custom schedule because this will take up some cpu because the way duplicati works is it actually takes your files and compresses them almost into like zip files um, so you can't just access the the backup directly you'd have to recover it using duplicati but that helps save storage and save transfers if you're doing it over a cloud connection. And so it does take some CPU. So you may not want to run all of these days or, or at a certain time when you may be you know, running this with something else that needs a CPU resources. So you can think that through on your own. I'm just gonna hit next. And then remote volume size. Really just don't set this above one gigabyte. Um, this is a little tricky to explain. You can click this link to see some more information. I'm just gonna save this as 500 megabytes. And then backup retention, we don't want to keep them all. So for me, I'm just going to say delete backups that are older than one month and then hit save. And then now we have this here and it looks like it's going to go ahead and run it on its own. And there it goes. It ran a whole backup. And if we go to our files, we'll see that we have our Casa share, but then under Casa Duplicati, we have these little volumes here. And these aren't super helpful on their own, but if you go back to Duplicati and go to restore, you can say restore from backup files or just Casa Local actually. Hit next. You can pick which backup you want to use. And then you could say, you know, let's say I accidentally delete this file. Let me go back to my Casa share. I'm going to delete this short. So it's not in here anymore. Let's go back to restore from Casa Local. Okay, and I just want to restore this single file because it's the only file on there. And I'm going to say original location. How do you want to handle existing files? You could do different versions. We don't have one because I just deleted it. And then, yeah, we'll do restore read and write permission. I'll just leave that off, but we'll hit restore. This will take a second because it does have to decompress those, those volumes that it saved. And then now it says successfully restored. And if we go back, we see, ha ha, our file is there. So... If you save your whole share to this, if something happens to drive one that has all of your data on it, but drive two is still okay, you can pull up Duplicati and grab those files and restore them back to a replacement drive if you put another two terabyte drive in there. So pretty cool. You could also just, I don't want this video to get too long, but you could do a cloud backup, which I highly recommend because yeah, having a backup on a drive sitting right next to the other drive is great, but what if that USB enclosure, you know, wigs out and fries both the drives well then you're in trouble so you could do an off-site backup and you could do a lot of different things i'm going to call this cloud or casa cloud and then i would recommend encrypting this so yeah might as well just put a quick password on here <laughs> strength is useless um yeah and then storage type we can click any one of these these things over here so you could use like amazon s3 storage you could do sftp server or you could go with something like Google Drive, Dropbox, whatever you want. I recommend B2 Cloud Storage is a great option because it's pretty affordable. Um, but yeah, I you know I said earlier not to use Google and stuff like that. But it you know if you already have Google Drive or you get it with you know a plan you already need anyway, you might as well take advantage of that storage and you can make a folder on your Google Drive. So if I just do like slash um, Casa, uh, I'm going to authorize this just don't look at what's going on here but it'll copy in it'll create these conditions using oauth i can hit test connection and it'll say the folder casa does not exist you want to create it i can hit yes and then i'll hit next and source data will do the same thing we'll say computer we'll go find our casa share and we'll just select our little video here hit next next i'm just skipping all this right now because it's it's fine and we'll hit save. 
We'll use weak passphrase. And then we'll run this cloud backup. And while that's running, I'm gonna secretly sign into my Google Drive. Okay, so it's successful. And then if I go into Google Drive here, you can see that I have all these, these volumes in here from Duplicati and same thing, I could restore it from the cloud. So pretty cool. It's a good way to help to protect your data and it's really pretty easy to set up. But back to the other problem we talked about earlier, what do we do if there's not an app in here that I wanna run? You know, that's a bummer. Well, while I want to keep this simple, I do wanna show that you can do what's called a custom install and set up your own containers from various images. So I'm actually gonna set up a Minecraft server with an image that I've used in the past. So it's this Mark TV slash Minecraft dash paper MC server. So it's a Minecraft paper server, but it's in a Docker container. And so we're just going to, you could read into some of the settings and things like that. I'm actually just going to grab this quick start command here. And then we're going to go to app store, custom install. And then instead of typing all this in manually, we can actually go to import Docker CLI and then paste it in and hit submit. And we'll get this notification saying, hey, we need to do some more stuff. Not everything filled out properly. And that is definitely the case because this Docker image is, it says run. That's because it didn't import it perfectly. We're going to have to fix that because the actual Docker image is this Mark TV slash whatever all this stuff is. So I can paste that, get rid of the Docker pull command. So just this Mark TV slash Minecraft dash this. That's where the actual Docker image is that it's going to look for, that it's going to pull. And then we can change the name to... Minecraft, um, for the logo, we may actually want it to be the Minecraft logo. So what we can do is just Google Minecraft logo, find a good image, and then copy the image address and paste it. And then under network, we're gonna have this as bridge ports. These ports are correct. This volume here is not what we want it to be. We need to make a new volume. So I'm going to once again, hop over into our files so I'm going to go back to our Casa share here and make a new folder and we're going to call it Minecraft config. Let's submit and we'll copy this path. And then in here, ah, config's fine. We could have called it data and that may have made more sense, but so it's whatever's in this Minecraft dash config folder is going to line up with whatever's in the slash data folder inside the container. And then under memory size, I'm gonna change this from one gig to three gigs, and I'm not gonna put those single quotes around it because that can cause it to mess up. But everything else should be good. Okay, we're gonna change CPU shares to high, which should hopefully give it a little bit more CPU headroom. And then restart policy we can set to unless stopped. So that means it's always gonna to try to restart if it crashes, unless we tell it to stop. And I think that's everything at this point. Usually copying it in uh, using the import command works a little better than this. It just some of them work really well and some of them don't work really well. But yeah, now we can hit install. In the meantime, I'm gonna open up Minecraft. Cool, so Minecraft is up and running. You can see it's doing a little bit of work on our CPU and RAM here, that's to be expected. I'm actually gonna hop into settings and then go to the logs and we'll see what all's going on here. Cause this does take a little while to get started. You can see it's still preparing some stuff. Sweet, so now it says done. And if we actually just for fun, oh gosh, get out of here, Minecraft. And actually just for fun, if we want to exit out of this and go to files, go to our Casa share and go to Minecraft config, we can actually see that Docker container through a whole bunch of stuff in here, including this world folder. And this is where all of the information for our Minecraft server world is, player data and so on. And you could also come in here and if you wanted to run some plugins, this is where you would drag those plugins to. And then if you wanted to, for example, change some settings on the server, you could go to this server properties and it's gonna be hard to edit this here, but you could go to something, I can open it with VS code here. And we can actually take this file and make some changes to it and then save it back to our share and then restart the container. And it would actually pull these new settings for the Minecraft server, so pretty cool. I'm gonna leave it as is though. Hop into Minecraft. I'm gonna say add new server. We'll call this Minecraft server Casa. And then it's probably better to use, I'm actually curious. If I do casaos.local, will it work? I haven't tried that in testing. Yeah, I didn't, oh, hey, I actually did. What I would recommend though is using your IP address, which now that you've gotten into the web UI, there's an easy way to grab that and that's to go to the terminal 
sign in as the Casa OS user. Uh, and then here we can just type in IP space A and it'll print off a whole bunch of stuff here, but what we want is probably something ENP something or something along those lines, but you should most likely see 192.168. something. So I can copy that and make the address that. Hit done. Okay. Hey, there we go. It's probably gonna be a little bit of a jittery experience because this isn't the most incredible hardware to be running this on. Fortunately, the paper server does help with some of that. You can actually see like it'll combine these entities to limit the number of blocks that are like spawned in the map. It'll kind of combine them all into a thing. But yeah, it's running. I'm on my Minecraft server right now. And it's probably, like I said, it's probably not going to be the best, especially if you have a lot of players on here all in different areas that it's trying to render all of those areas and simulate everything in those areas. But if you just wanted like a small, simple server for you and some friends, like, hey, it's, you know, it's not that bad. If we hop over to Casa OS again, we can see, yeah, CPU is pretty high. RAM is really high, but you know, it's not too, not too terrible. All right. So I'm actually going to stop our Minecraft service really quick. We can just hit this button. And it's gonna stop that Minecraft server so we're not taking up all of this RAM and CPU and stuff. But now I wanna move on to a VPN. Like I said, we're gonna use a VPN to you know, allow us to use that VPN if we're like at a coffee shop on some sketchy Wi-Fi or something. We can use a VPN to tunnel back into our home network just to have a little bit more security. But the main reason is to be able to access a lot of these services easily and securely from anywhere. And we're gonna use a thing called Tailscale, which is a mesh VPN service that's really easy to use and I've been messing around with it some recently. But there is an issue that we can't, there's, there's no app in the app store for it. And we could use a custom install, but we wanna use this as what's called an exit node. And it's really difficult to get an exit node running in a Docker container. Uh, so. To keep things simple, we're just going to install Tailscale directly onto our, our Debian install or the underlying operating system on this. And that's gonna take a little bit of command line, but I promise it's actually really easy. So first thing is I'm going to log into Tailscale. Okay, so I'm logged into Tailscale now, and you can see I have a couple of devices here. I'm gonna have a lot of this blurred out just for some safety reasons, but I have my phone and my desktop here. And we're going to add our server. So to do that, I'm actually just going to look up Tailscale Debian install. And we can go to Debian Bullseye, which is what we're on right now. And it's fairly easy. We just have a few commands to follow. And so I'm going to hop back into Casa OS, go to our terminal once again. And we're just going to copy these first two commands, paste them straight in. You'll have to type in your password here. We'll grab the second one, same thing, paste it and hit enter. And then we're gonna run sudo apt get update. And then we can copy the next one, but it's just sudo apt get install tail scale. That'll take a minute to install. Okay, and we wanna do two things with this that won't just work by default. We want this to operate as an exit node, meaning all of our traffic can be tunneled through our server, but we also wanna be able to route traffic to our local network through that server so that we can access, you know, if I'm on my computer across town, I can remote into my Minecraft server, for example, that's on my local network that may not necessarily be on that machine, if that makes sense. So what we're going to do is if you look up tail scale exit node. So if we go to this website here talking about exit nodes, we can look how to configure that. And the first thing you have to do is make sure that it is advertised as an exit node. And so for Linux, when you run it, there's a few things we have to do. So first of all, before we do any of this, we need to run a couple of these commands. So what this is going to do right here is copy some stuff into our sys control um, config, I believe. I'm probably saying some of this wrong because I'm not a Linux guy. But all that's going to do is the echo basically just means like, hey, take this right here and then we're going to pipe it into this config. And then same thing with the second one. We don't really probably need IPv6, but we're going to do it anyway. Paste, enter. And then we just have to 
basically make those changes take effect. That's going to allow IPv forwarding, which we need for passing traffic through our server. Uh, don't worry about the nitty gritty, it's fine. And then we don't have to do any of this firewall um, dash CMD stuff. It should work just fine as is. But we're going to need to remember this advertise exit node command. Because when we run, if we, if we go back to the original instructions here, it says sudo tail scale up, but we need to run a few extra commands with it. So we'll have to remember this advertise exit node, but then we also want to set this up as a subnet router. And if we go to the subnet router instructions here, it says the exact same thing. We need to set up this IPv forwarding, but then we also need to use this advertise routes command. So this is where you would type in what's called your subnet, which most likely if your IP address is 192.168.1. something or zero dot something, you would type in, you know, if it was 192.168.0.1 was like the address of your router and all of your IP addresses were 192.168.0. something, you would type in 192.168.0.0 slash 24. We'll do that in just a second. So I actually have this command kind of ready to go here just for the sake of the video. So I'm going to copy that. But back in our terminal, we're just going to paste this command. So it's sudo tail scale up. And then we have this dash dash reset. Um, don't worry too much about that. You may get an error if you don't have that dash dash reset there. But then we have dash dash advertise routes. And then I put in my subnet, which is 192.168.10.0 slash 24. Like I said, if you if your IP address for your server says like 192.168.1, dot something you'll do this as 192.168.1.0 slash 24 and then dash dash advertise exit node is our last argument there so we should be able to hit enter and it's going to give us this at address to go to so i'm going to copy it oh i'm going to copy and paste and i'm going to sign in but i'm going to blur it it's going to say do you want to connect the device cost OS to blah, 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 all blurred out. And I'm going to hit connect. And then now we can go back to our admin panel and we'll see that we have this Casa OS here. Um, I need to do a lot of blurring on this. All right, so we have a Casa OS here. That's great. And we can click these three dots and go to edit route settings. And we're going to set this up as an exit node. We also have key expiry is enabled. If we didn't want that to be the case, we could fix it. We'll fix it in a second. Uh, and then subnet routes, we want to be able to allow people onto my local or allow my connections onto my local network, um, which will be really helpful. And then last, we're going to go to disable key expiry. You could enable that. You just have to every now and then rerun this command to make sure you know, whatever. But this is just going to be running at my house all the time. So we can leave it disabled. And now I'm actually going to record my phone really quick. Okay, so now I'm in my phone here and I'm in the TailScale app and I'm going to enable this and I can also go up here and hit use exit node and I'm going to select Casa OS and now I'm on cellular. You can see at the top right, I'm on cellular. So I'm actually, I'm actually going to disable this really quick. I'm actually going to go to nordvpn.com just to see their IP address here. So one of you know, I'm not going to show the whole thing here, but you can see part of the IP address here. Now, if I go back, and I enable this. You can see it says using exit node Casa OS. And then if I reload this, what's my IP address? I'm not going to show the whole thing, but you can see that it changed. It is not the same as it used to be before. And I can actually, if I go to 192.168.10.41, that's the location of my TrueNAS server, which is on my local network. And I can, I can see that, which is really cool. I can actually even go to 192.168 dot 10 dot 187 which is my casa os server you can see i can get to my casa os there is this cool thing called magic dns that i should be able to just type in casa os here maybe a slash after yeah so i can type in casa os and just put a slash after just to make sure it's not thinking i'm trying to google search and it'll actually take me straight to that and that's a feature of tail scale it's pretty cool 
Cool, so we have a home server running quite a few different things. And hopefully at this point, you, you may feel comfortable enough to start adding some other services that are either on the App Store or maybe not. And if you're interested in this sort of stuff and you wanna learn more, maybe check out a few of my other videos like this one where I converted an old desktop PC into an Unraid server, or this video where I set up a NAS using Open Media Vault. Once again, if you like this video, make sure and give it a like as that really goes a long way. And maybe consider subscribing if you're interested in watching more. That's about it for this one though. So as always, thank you so much for watching, stay curious, and I can't wait to see you in the next one.